great. Well, thank you so much uh, to the organizers for putting together this wonderful Congress today. It's really exciting to be a part of this and see all the great work that's being presented. Um, today, I'm going to talk about the genetics of malaria resistance in ancient Rome uh, and what we can tell from the impacts of this pathogen using ancient human genomes um, to study this. Uh, I want to mention my whole team that's been working on this, so sort of a number of people that have made this possible, especially David Pickle, Alessandro Sperduti, and Francesca Candilio, uh, who are co-leading this with me. Um, so a bit of advance the slides. Great. Uh, yeah, so malaria is an infectious disease caused by several species of protozoan parasites in the genus Plasmodium. It's transmitted between human hosts by mosquitoes, and according to the most recent World Health Organization estimates, um, 219 million people are infected uh, with malaria yearly, resulting in half a million deaths, and it impacts 87 countries worldwide. Uh, so this is a disease that still has a, a huge uh, global impact, even though you can see in the plot that the, the distribution of malaria is shrinking, it's still a, a major disease um, with a number of challenges um, that, that are being tackled, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and perhaps sort of looking at trajectories in the past could be useful to some of these efforts, future efforts for containment and mitigation of this disease. Um, so there's some sources for the uh, distribution of malaria in the ancient Mediterranean. There's sort of two primary theories about how malaria became uh, globalized or widely dispersed through the ancient Mediterranean. Um, some have suggested that plasmodium parasites were thought to have been introduced following the introduction of farming during the Neolithic transition. Um, and then others have suggested that perhaps it was due to further intensification of mobility in the Bronze and Iron Ages, as well as people moving into cities where they're closer to one another and also closer to standing water uh, that would allow for the transmission of uh, uh, plasmodium through uh, mosquito uh, uh, vectors. Um, and it's also possible that both of these could have played a role because there are uh, several different strains of mosquito or several different strains of the parasite and several different species of mosquitoes uh, that carry it. So these both may have played a factor in it. Uh, there have been a couple of studies uh, that have identified ancient malarial DNA um, in Italy, for instance. Um, so we have uh, identification of the parasite being present in at least the second century CE in Italy from a paper by uh, Stephanie Marciniak um, and the team that she works with. Um, and we have some indications of the health impact of malaria in ancient Rome. Um, there's several sources of evidence that suggest malaria might have had a large impact on the city and the empire in the past. Uh, mortality rates for malaria have, uh, it's been suggested that they may have been one of the reasons uh, that Rome relied so heavily on immigration by Prouse et al. Um, the Romans associated swamps and marshy regions with poor health and fever um, linked to miasma. So you can see a picture here of, of standing water, and there would have been a lot of that, even with sort of efforts to drain these marshy regions. There still would have been standing water both in marshes and then also um, uh, in irrigation and other uh, cisterns, things like that, that, you know, with standing water, mosquitoes then can, can reproduce. Um, Celsus also uh, noticed these recurrent fevers that are typical of malaria, that they will reoccur, uh, they'll spike, and then they'll reoccur on like the third or fourth day of infection. Uh, and Walter Scheidel and Kyle Harper have noticed a, a peak in deaths in ancient Rome between uh, the months of August and November, which uh, is abnormal for infectious disease, usually infectious disease deaths peak in the winter. And so this uh, peak in the late summer and autumn could be linked to malaria. So a lot of these are indirect sources of evidence that malaria or some sort of pathogen was having a big effect on the ancient Roman population. Um, yeah, and the evidence they used for that was inscriptional data about dates of death. Uh, and so, as I mentioned before, there's uh, some direct evidence as well, including this um, contextual evidence. There's also direct evidence for malaria's impact on ancient Rome. Um, there's been three individuals that have be been identified at three different sites in central and southern Italy um, that have carried the ancient malaria pathogen. And those are the only ancient individuals that malaria has been identified in so far. Um, it's been tricky to, to actually get malaria pathogens from the past due to preservation. So a limited number, but some and, and indicating it is present in this region. Uh, there's also a high rate of uh, protective variants. And that's what we're going to talk about in the rest of the talk is these are variants that humans carry that can provide some level of protection against malaria. Um, you've probably heard of sickle cell anemia. That's one of the most common ones um, that if you have two copies of this variant, it can lead to, to um, 
anemia, and then if you have one copy, it you don't have the um, anemia manifestation, but you do have some protection against malaria. Um, and then there's other variants that are prevalent in the Mediterranean, um, including the G6PT deficiency, um, yeah, which is especially um, uh, frequent in Sardinia, for instance. Um, yeah, and this is a map from that Marciniak et al. paper that I mentioned previously showing where malaria was present in 1882. Um, so this is sort of uh, gives us a glimpse, you know, we don't know how far we can project this into the past, but it does show um, some of the regions where malaria, as shown in blue, would have been highly prevalent, especially before modern containment efforts. And this is that original map that you can see. So you can see Rome is, is in the midst of this quote unquote uh, malaria belt. So this is somewhere that might have had uh, much more impact for malaria than other parts of Italy, for instance, or other parts of Europe, which will become relevant um, in just a second. Yeah, so this is one of the papers I mentioned by Stephanie Marciniak that actually identifies the ancient malaria pathogen. Um, and then this is another paper, and we're working with the lead author in this, Perry Galabert. Um, and what they did was they studied um, ancient genomes published from across Europe. This was in 2017, so there's fewer ancient genomes back then to study than there are now. Uh, but they found that malaria was a weak selective force in ancient European populations. Uh, and so this is a figure from their study. These was these were the data available at that point. So you can see um, very few from Italy, only from northern Italy, and that a lot of these were pre-Roman. So you can see Upper Paleolithic, Neolithic, Bronze Age, Iron Age. So many of the much of the data available at the point was sort of earlier than the the Roman period um, and not focused in Italy. So we are curious whether um, if we took a similar approach now, especially focusing on Rome and on Italy, if we'd see something different. Uh, and very conveniently, they identified uh, a set of variants uh, to look at that are associated with uh, resistance to malaria or protection from malaria. Uh, so what we did is we used a different data set, um, and this is one that we published. I had the great opportunity to work on this, um, where we sequenced 127 genomes from in and around Rome across time. So from about the past 12,000 years from the uh, Mesolithic through the medieval period. Um, and so it's not that many compared to how many people lived in Rome over time, but it is um, to give us an idea of what the population of the city was like through time. Um, and so this is a figure just showing when these um, individual genomes are from, a few early genomes, and then most are concentrated in the Imperial Roman period, late antiquity, and the medieval and early modern period. Uh, and so what we're interested in here is, you know, is the story in Italy and in Rome different than perhaps sort of across Europe? Um, just given sort of the the presence or the indications of the presence of malaria in Rome through time. Um, and so what we did is we looked at these same genetic variants that Galibert et al. looked at, um, and we see quite a few of them shown in white remain stable through time, so they're sort of not becoming more frequent or less frequent, they're just staying the same. One becomes less frequent through time, and then five of these increase over time. So I plotted that. This is just the allele frequency. Uh, and you can see this is for each one of the variants. So this one becomes frequent early and then is nearly fixed in the population. It's nearly 100%. And then we see four that become uh, common later on and then stay present and sort of slowly increase through time. Um, and so for this first variant, we wondered if sort of the big question then becomes, is it changing because of population shifts, because of mobility, because of new people moving into the city, or is it changing because of selective pressures um, on the population? And so for this earlier one, we think what might be happening is that there's a genetic shift happening in Rome. Um, this is a PCA plot, and to quickly orient you to it, these labels here represent modern populations across um, uh, North Africa, the Middle East, and Europe. And so these are modern populations shown here with these labels. Uh, and these lines here sort of represent the distribution of uh, genetic data from those modern uh, groups organized by country. And then the points here represent ancient individuals. So these are the ancient individuals from in and around Rome. And you can see um, this transition from the Mesolithic period to the Neolithic period comes with this big population shift. So that's what we think might be happening with this first spike here, is that there might be, because there's a big population shift with the introduction of farming, this may be uh, due to people uh, moving into the region, <clears throat> and it's harder to connect that to selection. So we're gonna focus on these four, um, but then at the end I'll tell you a way maybe we can, can more formally test whether this is selection or mobility or both. Um, and so then this is the trajectory of these four additional resistance variants um, 
yeah, there's uh, one case study I'd like us to consider is this blue trend. Uh, you can see that these sort of start in uh, the Neolithic through Iron Age and then slowly increase through time in the Imperial period, late antiquity. And there's a little bit of a dip for a number of them in the medieval and early modern period. Uh, and one that I think is particularly interesting is the Duffy allele, which is a, a pretty famous variant that's protective of malaria, very common um, in sub-Saharan Africa, especially, um, and it's protective of uh, falciparum malaria. Um, and so it seems to have appeared in Rome in the first, or in central Italy in the Iron Age, and then increased uh, slowly through time. Um, and as you can see, this is sort of that PCA plot again, where you see the ancient individuals projected onto modern populations. Uh, you see this uh, sort of heterogeneity starting in the Iron Age here, a shift in population uh, in the imperial period towards the Eastern Mediterranean. So if you're sort of uh, thinking of this central region as sort of individuals projecting onto modern Italy, um, and then this would be uh, a lot of ancestry coming from uh, the Eastern Mediterranean into Imperial Rome in uh, the Imperial period. And then in late antiquity, um, you see these outlier individuals uh, from parts of continental Europe. Um, and in the medieval and early modern period, you see a, a sort of bimodal distribution is how I like to describe this of part of the population is continuous with these two preceding periods and part of the population um, yeah seems to be from uh, continental or has ancestry from continental Europe so you see sort of the shift in population there in the medieval and early modern period um, yeah so one of the reasons that I showed you those ancestry shifts is that this variant this Duffy allele is consistently rising even despite these ancestry shifts so to me that indicates this would be a really good um, uh, target to look at for selection, that even though we're seeing these ancestry shifts over time, this one is consistently rising, that it was introduced, uh, as we said before, um, I guess in the imperial period, and then increases, and these are the individuals um, that carry that variant, so this protective variant. So that might mean that something is, is pushing it up in frequency, even as we see uh, these big shifts in population. Um, yeah, and so then I guess the the and one of the reasons that I think that we might be seeing a little bit of a decrease here in the medieval and early modern period is people with ancestries from um, Central Europe, especially in continental Europe, where um, there hasn't been that much selective pressure for malaria. So I think that's uh, probably what's causing this dip here in this uh, period for a number of these variants. Um, yeah, and so just to wrap up, I uh, had mentioned there might be some ways to tell a difference or to test this difference between um, uh, selection and mobility. And so there's two recent papers that have come out, both of which I find really exciting. They have methods for doing this. This is one from um, Amy Goldberg's group at Duke, um, led by Iman Hamid. And so they look at um, the Cabo Verde population and they look at this same variant that we're interested in. And essentially they can uh, look at ancestry proportions across the whole genome. So that's what you're seeing here is chromosome one, chromosome two, uh, and they see a really high contribution of West African ancestry around this variant. So that's suggesting that this variant sort of, um, when you compare it to the rest of the genome has been selected for um, in relation to the non-protective variant. So this protective variant seems to have been selected for um, and sort of studying this sort of by ancestry helps disentangle mobility versus selection questions. Um, and then a really exciting preprint came out, I think last week, this week, very recently, where they took a similar method and they uh, used the ancestry components to, to look at um, selection of, of beneficial variants uh, within ancestry components. So that would be something that we could do too, to get a better sense of um, what's driving this allele frequency change in Rome. Um, yeah, so that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening, paying attention. I included this picture here just to represent sort of bridging archaeological um, and scientific approaches to, to the population of ancient Rome. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for your attention and then thanks to all the people I've worked with that have made this possible.